Okay, so um, I'm Ben Clifford, and I'm going to talk about parsing stuff in Haskell, um, which was my first real use of Haskell when I went from, oh, this is this theoretically nice, but I don't really know what to do with it language. And then I came across parser combinators, and they let me do stuff that in my other work where I was using Java and C, suddenly it was a lot easier in Haskell. Okay. So um, what I mean by parsing, Basically, you've got a, a string of symbols, maybe letters or something in a file, and we're going to turn it into something uh, interesting in memory, and then afterwards we we'll do something interesting with that when it's in memory. So that sounds quite abstract. What I, what I was doing at the time I started doing this was a lot of stuff with grep and sed and orc and Perl, munching text files and things like that. So I, I wasn't coming to it from, a, from the side of a sort of computer science degree. What I was coming from was these very dirty log files and things like that that I needed to rearrange um, in different ways. Um, and what I found was that, that doing made made things um, a lot easier. So let's do some something really simple. Here's the number 57, represented as um, a string. So there's a five, and there's a seven, and I can add one to 57 is a number, I can add one to it, right? Is that going to work? No, okay. No, okay. Why is it not going to work? Because that, oh, I've revealed the answer, sorry. Ah, stop. This 57 isn't a number as far as Haskell is concerned, it's just these symbols. There's a symbol that is an ASCII 5 and a symbol that's an ASCII 7. Oh, hello. <laughs> wow. Loads of people. <laughs> you only missed one slide. Um, so, if you're just doing really simple stuff like that in Haskell, there's a really nice thing called the read type class. And you can just say read 57, it'll give you a number, and um, you'll get whatever the appropriate type is, and then we can add one to it, and we get 58. Okay, and that works really well. Um, for anything that looks roughly like Haskell's source code. So something that you would put in a, in a variable definition in Haskell, you can shove in through read. Um, that's pretty simple. Um, that's not what the bulk of this talk is going to be about, but I sort of felt obliged to say, if you just want to read in simple stuff, you, you don't have to go through all of this complexity. Sometimes it can just be this simple. Um, so, some more data. Um, common one is comma separated values. So, we've got um, some fields there separated from commas, some numbers, some strings, whatever. Another, another structured thing you might want to parse is um, network protocols. So, we've got um, a, an example of an HTTP session there um, that you might want to break down so that you can then build your web server around it, whatever. Okay. Using this is, um, uh, thing called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, which probably a bunch of you have come across. Um, and it, it's a structured data format for um, putting structured data in that, that's based on the JavaScript syntax. Um, so this is some I downloaded off the internet. It's actually meetup.com's representation of this meetup that we're at now. You can see there's a very hopeful RSVP limit of 90. Um, it tells you where it is. We're near Greenwich, so the longitude's about zero. Um, there's the time encoded as an integer. Whatever, nice, nicely structured. Okay, and um, maybe I want to read my program and um, do something with it. Okay. Um, so here's a, a slightly more simple JavaScript example that you might actually be able to in your head. Um, so JavaScript object values, they kind of start with these um, squiggly braces and they have name value pairs. And then the values can be strings like Ben in quotes. Um, they can be booleans, true or false. They can be lists of values or arrays of values which are, have got square brackets and numbers. That's not particularly complicated. Okay. 
And what I'm going to do is pass some of this stuff into um, memory. Um, so let's import some stuff. What I'm going to use is Parsec, the, the um, uh, it's a parser. It's been around quite a long time. It's in the Haskell platform, I think. Um, there are newer parser libraries, but this is kind of my trusty, faithful one that I remember how to use and use every time. And then I'm going to stick parsers together um, using um, the applicative functor library and the monad library. So monads, hopefully you've all something with a little bit, even if you don't have some deep theoretical understanding. And then applicative functors are sort of the same but different. Um, and I'm going to introduce some of the bits from applicative functors in the talk. I'm not going to point them out as being from applicative functors. And a lot of the time, you're just hopefully going to see that as another example if you try and understand applicatives later. So here's a really simple JavaScript value. True. Okay. Let's try and parse it. Okay. There's a parser that's going to parse the string true. It's called match true. Um, it's got a type of parser string. So that means it's a parser. It's going to return a string. And I'm using a function from parsec that just says, take this string and try and match it. And if I try and use it, it works like this. So I've got a Haskell, a parsec thing called parse. And I can feed in the parser that I've just written. And I can feed in a string to parse. Ignore this. It wants a comment, which really annoys me. But just ignore the middle field there. So in the first example, the example I feed in true. And the second example, I feed in the word lemon. Okay, And what we get back is an either value. If it worked, it says right. And the value in there is our string, true. If it's wrong, we get a left value back. And there's an error message. So does everyone know what the either type is in Haskell? Put your hand up if you don't, and I'll elaborate. No? OK. So when I said um, this is a parser for a string, it's this value in here in the right that is a string. Okay, if I parsed a, a double, then that value would be a double in there. So that parse is <coughs> not very useful. Here's another not very useful parser. It's called always true. And it's a parser that's going to return a, a Boolean. Um, Right out. If I feed in the string, I get back correct, right, it's a tr and the value is true, okay, which is a, you'll see it's a, a Boolean this time. If I feed in the string lemon, I get the same thing. It's parsed okay, and what we've got back is true. And whatever I feed in, even if it's false, we still get back this, this Boolean true. Um, so what I've used is this thing called pure, which comes from the applicative functor library and says, Whatever, whatever I give you, just always return this value. I ignore whatever text I give you. So I've got a string which will, a parser that will match the word true, and a parser that will return a Boolean true in, instead of a string. It would be nice if I could put those together so that if I fed in the word true, I'm going to get a Haskell Boolean out. Okay? So I want something that looks like this. Um, I want it to return a boolean, so I say it's a, a parser for a bool. And what I can use is this star arrow operator to put them together. So this says, for match true, if that works, carry on and do the next parser. And what will happen um, is if I feed in true, I get back boolean true this time. So I converted this into, into my Haskell data type. And if not, I still get the same error that I got before. Okay, and um, so what I'm using to do that is this, I don't really know how you pronounce these operators, um, star arrow, star greater than operator, which says, first do what's on this side, then do what's on this side, and return the value that the arrow is pointing at. So you see there's another one later where the arrow is pointing in the other direction. Um, so it'll try and run the first parser, and we know that'll return true, but whatever, it either works or it doesn't. That's all we care about. 
Okay. Do the same for the word false and returning the pure value false. Um, I don't even put up examples for that and it will work just like the other. So two parsers, one that will match true and return a, a Haskell true type and one that will match the string false and return um, the false type. Maybe we could get a parser that if we feed in true we get out true, if we feed in false we get false. And um, that's what this combinator does. So I can say first try the boolean true, if it works give me the result. If not, try boolean false. If that works, give me the result. And if not, we fail. And so here's an example of running it. I parse and I pass in true, I get out true. Pass in false, I get out false. And if I pass in lemon, then it says, oh, well, I was expecting this. I was expecting either the string true or the string false. So what I'm going to do is build up some of the other data types in JSON. That Boolean one is pretty straightforward. Um, it's just got two values. Um, another one um, are these string literals. So that's um, some text surrounded by quotes. Okay. Um, and what I want is to just get the string out from the middle. So what I can say is um, I'm going to use this um, star arrow operator and there's a, a backwards one here, arrow star, and those are pointing at the middle. So that says, run these three in sequence and return whatever the middle bit is. Okay. So it introduces a few things, <coughs> excuse me, a few more things. Um, I've got this char parser, and what that'll do is match a single character. Um, so I'm saying match a quote, find the quote that, that starts the string. Um, and then at the end of it, I'm matching another quote that's the quote that ends the string and in the middle I'm saying um, this many none of quote so none of will match a character as long as it isn't a quote because I've said make sure it's not a quote and many you give it a parser and it will run that parser over and over again until it can't pull any more okay. so what I'm saying is find a quote we will get a value back that's a, a quote find a lot of stuff that isn't a quote and then find another quote and then forget everything apart from this bit in the middle and when I run it if I feed in the string quote hello quote I get um, Java, uh, the Haskell string hello if I feed in true which was one of these boolean values I get an error because this isn't a parser for booleans it's a par parser for strings <coughs> So um, the JavaScript notation says I can always put, if I, I, it's not strongly typed, I can put a boolean somewhere, I can put a string somewhere, I can put a number. It, it's not typed, they can always be substituted. So maybe I can use this um, alternative operator again and maybe I could say, well, here's a parser that's going to parse a boolean and then a string literal. Okay, um, looks like it might work. Okay, what happens if we try and use it? Well, first, what's the type going to be? It's going to be a parser for something, but what's the return value going to be? It's not going to be a boolean, and um, because string literal doesn't return a boolean, it can't be a string because the boolean parser doesn't return um, a string. And um, if you try and compile that, you get a, a compile error like this, where embedded in there, you see that it says it can't match up a boolean and a character array. Boop. So maybe I can wrap things in a, in a sort of tag structure. So I, I make this um, JSON tag structure. I have a, a B constructor and I can wrap a boolean in that or an S constructor and I can wrap a string in that. Okay. Then I just need to write a parser like this that says here's a parser for, J for JSON values straightforward. Maybe I can write this. Boolean or parse a string literal. Okay, is that going to work? Okay, that's not going to work because these two parsers don't return the right type. They, they return a string and a boolean, they don't return a JSON value. So 
there's the compile error. But what I've got is those two. What I want is some parsers that somehow do return, the, they return the wrapped values. Okay? And if I've got those two, I can combine them together like this. So let's look at the uh, Boolean. Um, Boolean parser. So we start off, we've got a parser for Boolean, we've got our, our tag structure for JSON values, which is this B constructor, and um, we want to end up with a parser called JSON bool, which is going to um, parse like the, the Boolean parser, but um, return um, a wrapped Boolean. So it's pretty straightforward. This second block here, you just stick B, arrow dollar whatever bool or equivalently you can say fmap b boolean um, so that comes from applicative functions it's a, a little bit like this is a bit that I found very hard to understand to be it's nice when you do understand it is it's it's quite like a, a map over a list well that's the theory behind it what we're saying is um, whatever this this bool whatever this bool parser does here when we get the um, run it, we'll get an answer out and then apply this function on the front to that. Okay, So I put the, um, the type signature up here. You feed in a function that goes from A to B and a parser that gives you an A and what you get out is a parser that gives you a B. So um, just remember that the B constructor is actually a function that goes from a boolean to, um, to a JSON value. You declare it as a constructor, but a constructor acts as a, a function that you can use in this place. So <coughs> when we use it, if we pass in true, we get out this true wrapped in a B tag. And if we pass in false, we get false wrapped in a B tag. And if we pass in something else, we get out an error again. So we can do the same for string literals. Um, we've got our string literals already, and we um, map this S um, which means that whatever string the string literal um, parser parses it'll be through the S constructor and we'll end up with a JSON value okay so now we have these two um, using we these parsers and we can um, stick them together with um, the alternative operator because the types will match up okay so if we pass in hello we get out an S tag passing true, then we get a B tagged Boolean true. Okay. So now let's move on and look at um, JSON arrays. As an example, JSON, say, um, what have we got? Five values. Got hello, goodbye, true, false, true, and. Um, so you can see then they're, they're not like Haskell lists they don't have to be the same type okay each value's got its own type um, and what I want to do is make a make an array that's going to uh, make a parser that's going to return um, a Haskell list of, of JSON values okay so it looks a little bit like um, when I did strings start and end with these start and end characters so I used quotes before. What I'm using here is square brackets. Um, and I'm using the um, applicative arrow, start arrow functions there um, to say, well, you need to match this start and end. And there's going to be some filling in the middle. Um, and what I've done is written um, a different filling. So instead of matching just any characters, what I've said is I want some um, JavaScript values separated by commas. So we've got this set by operator um, that we can feed in two parsers, and um, it'll 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 parse out the text and say, well, I need a value, a comma, a value, a comma, a value, a comma. Okay, and um, then we can do the same thing with fmap there, and stick um, stick an a constructor on the front. Okay, objects. That's a JavaScript object at the top. It's a bracket. Uh, you call those curly braces at the start and the end. 
and we've got these pairs in the middle. Um, so there's always a string key and there's a, um, a JavaScript value. So I do the same thing. I've sort of compressed it all into one. I've got an O constructor on the front and I'm looking for the close and end braces. And this time I'm looking for a thing called an object. Again, separated by commas. So, what the, the only difference here between um, the array and the object definition is before I was asking for a JavaScript value where it says object entry, and now I've written a more complicated parser, um, which is here. So, that's what the filling looks like in that top box. We've got a key in quotes, it's a string literal, and a value. Um, and what I want to get out is a, a pair, a, a tuple of a string and whatever that value is. So what you can do here, and th this is what um, I used to write a lot of my style, is you can use monadic oh, I, You can use um, monadic notation. So um, rather than sticking my parsers together with um, these arrow, star arrow combinators, alternative pipe um, combinator, what you can do is put them in a and say, um, run these parsers in a sequence and assign that what they output to these variable names. So it looks, it ends up looking like this sequential program that you're writing. And then at the end, we end up, um, we pulled out a string literal, put it in a variable called key, got a called, um, called, um, make our pair just using the variables using return. So there's something to parse, parse b a colon true, and we end up with write and a pair. We've got the key and the value, and the value is a wrapped. JavaScript um, type. Okay, and then um, when we run it through the whole thing, um, this is a JSON value um, with the same data in it, and we end up with an, an O tag and our object inside. Yeah. The which notation? Oh, this one, the do notation. Yeah. So yeah. From yeah. Um, no. So um, one of the things with bind, which is what make or well, it's what makes monads different from applicatives. So um, star arrow is from the applicative library, and, and bind is the monad library. One of the things. I don't do here um, is I could use that value for key to change which um, I'm using later on in the sequence um, and that's what bind does um, you if you try to do that with the star arrow notation you wouldn't be able you can't get that value into the other side of your expression to try and use it okay so you can't have things like if using that, uh, that applicative notation, and you can here. Um, so the, the reason I'm using monadic notation here is purely because the syntax looks nicer for wiring bits of um, wiring variable names together. And um, you can also use arrow notation, um, which kind of looks like this, but I find it a bit uglier. But you would use that for the same reason that this gives you a really nice way to, what I think is a nice way for, for naming values and wiring them together later on. Okay. Um, if you want to, you could, you could change, say, um, I was parsing a thing that said what's coming next is an int, and then there was an int, or if I said what's coming next is a bool, and then there was a bool. So I know I can change what I'm expecting later using monads. Um, in the data that I parse, that, that's rare. Possibly I've never needed to do it, um, which is why the applicative stuff is 
enough. Okay. This is what we get up to. <coughs> okay, so that's mostly enough of a, a parser. What I haven't done is numbers. So the way I'm not going to show you numbers, but the way you would do is something along the lines of like the actual JavaScript, the actual J JSON number notation is quite complicated in its full generality. But you would want to match some minus sign and some digits and a full stop and then combine them all together into an integer. Okay, and um, I didn't bother writing the whole thing because it's quite did make a cheat one if you download the source code later you'll see. Okay. Um, and with that that's it pretty much enough to, to parse um, JSON. Okay? So yeah, I'm not leaving JSON yet. But carry on. Ah. Yeah. Yes. So we'll read the present slide. <laughs> so here's something that we wrote a parser for, an array true, true, true. And what we get back is a tagged array with three tagged Booleans in there. Okay, so we've ended up with this nice, or oh, nice-ish, Haskell data structure representation of the JavaScript. Okay, and that's really why we're parsing stuff is so that um, stuff turns into Haskell data structures. If you want to do a case against it or pattern match, or whatever you want, it's now in Haskell data structure land, not JSON land. Okay. So the next block, we do the same thing. It's, it's list true, 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 and that should work, right? But it doesn't. Okay. It's, instead of giving us right in the data, we get an error where the arrow is, I've got an unexpected space. Okay, as it turns out, we haven't done any white space. Um, so what can we do? We're going to have to retrofit space into it. Um, so I made a parser called WS white space, and it matches um, many occurrences of any of the following, a space, a tab, or a new line. Um, I think that's probably enough for matching a white space. There might be some other characters that count, but if there were, you would put them in this parser as well. Comments. Oh, yeah, yeah, comments. Yeah, yeah, so you could put that in there. Can you not? Oh, okay. oh yeah, right. No, you can't. That's why they aren't on that diagram that I implemented. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an encoding problem as well. So I'm going to make a combinator of my own called Lexi, and it takes a parser as a parameter. What it does is says, let's run that parser and then look for white space after it and throw white space away. <coughs> so now I can make a new Boolean parser um, out of my old Boolean parser by just saying, well, I'll stick a tick on the end of the name of the original one, and um, I'll make the, the real JSON bull parser run through Lexi. And what that means is whenever I try and parse a boolean, it'll do all the parsing look for, and look for white space after it. Okay? I can't just discard white space everywhere because it matters in some places. For example, inside string literals, I don't want to just forget white space there. There's only very certain places that I can look for. Um, white space. So what I'm going to do is, wherever those places are, I can now put this Lexeme wrapper around those parsers. Okay. So um, there's bool and there's string literal. Okay. Um, the array. Well, I need to put the Lexeme wrap around the um, open and close brackets, and I need to put it around the comma, but I don't need to put it around the JSON value because the JSON value is going to be built up things that already deal with their own wipes, white space. 
Okay, so that's what was happening before. It was failing. Now, um, with this Lexeme wrap around everything, we can parse true, 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 and we get out nice Haskell data structure, just like we did if the spaces weren't there. Okay, so there's your question answered. <laughs> Perfectly timed. Okay, so let's go back to this great big slab of um, JSON. Okay, can I parse this? Well, I don't want to type this into my source file just to demonstrate it to you. Um, so I'm going to put it in a data.txt and I'm going to use um, this IO action at the top called parse from file. So that's a parsec. Um, parsec helper that you say here's the file data.txt and here's the parse where I want you to apply to that file and get x is bound to this big um, thing that looks like a Haskell format version of the data it's parsed okay so we've got it's an object so we've got that o tag and then we've got all of the um, different fields see that the venue is nested so we've put a nested o in there okay and um, because that's in Haskell now, we can do things like parse it and then pattern match. Here's an ugly looking pattern match that looks for, um, it pulls the guts out of the, the level object and it does a list lookup on them. So I can look up the status, I can look up the RSVP limit, look up is, or maybe the prelude, but it's very standard list look up and those are the answers that I get out so um, one of the disadvantages with um, this kind of encoding because um, JSON is very flexible is we've got really ugly type labels everywhere so we've got an S whenever there's a string and there's a, an N whenever there's a number and a, a B for a boolean um, and that sort of comes from the the flexible typeness flexible typeness of of JavaScript compared to to Haskell. If you if you can if you're um, parsing a data file that you know the types ahead of time, say you're parsing a CSV and you know you're going to have a string and then a number and then two strings, you you don't have to do wrappers like that. You can pull it down in much more concise um, format. Okay going to um, leave JSON for a moment and talk about something else because I couldn't find an example of this in JSON so I had to make something up um, so let's say uh, make a parser that's going to read day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and it's going to return the number of the day of the week so you might think we'll write something like this if you match a Monday return 1 if you match Tuesday return 2, Wednesday return 3, and so on up to Sunday. Okay. So we can try using it. If we pass in Monday, we get 1. If we pass in Tuesday, we get 2. If we pass in Wednesday, we get 3. If we pass in Thursday, it doesn't work. Okay? So, what's going wrong? If you look at the error message, it said, well, I was expecting Tuesday. And what's happened is <coughs> it turns out that um, alternative operator, the pipe symbol, is a little bit more complicated than, than I initially said. What it, what it will do is um, go back to here. It will try the first parser, and as long as that first parser doesn't match anything at all, doesn't match any of the input, it'll move on to the next one. Um, which is fine up until we get to feeding in Thursday because this second parser, Tuesday, does match some of the input. It starts off and it matches a capital T. And so at that point, um, the way this pipe operator says um, works, you're committed to looking for Tuesday now. Okay, it's not going to, even if that parser then fails, it's not going to try any alternatives. Okay. Um, so this doesn't work. What we 
can do is stick try on the front okay, of the misbehaving Tuesday part. And what that will do is it'll try and pass Tuesday. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, we pretend we haven't touched the input at all. Right? Um, so we sort of backtrack, pretend we weren't there at all. And then the alternative operator can um, carry on checking the other, um, the other possibilities. And if we, um, we <coughs> excuse me, we can actually write our own combinator that does that try for you automatically. So if we try that, that'll work. Okay. Um, the re well, one of the reasons why you don't want to do that the whole time is um, it, it makes the alternative operator much more symmetric. It doesn't matter which way around you put the answers, but it makes things um, a lot more expensive because if Monday fails halfway through, we still have to try all of the seven other alternatives, um, which if it's just matching words isn't really a, 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 a problem. But say you're parsing a source file and you don't know if it's C or C or Fortran and you go all the way through your C file and you get right to the end and then there's a missing semicolon but you've seen for the last kilobytes that it's a C source file okay the right thing to do in that case is say I was looking at this C source file there's a problem the wrong thing to do is say all right we'll just go all the way to the start and now we'll try and pass the whole thing as a Fortran source file just in case it works okay um, which is what that try mechanism does and very often it's the, the wrong thing to do so we don't need it at all when parsing JSON um, that's a, a language that's nice enough to um, to figure figure things out without without needing it but sometimes it's nice to have yeah yeah Um, it will uh, no I think it will keep the Tuesday error message in there right? um, but yeah it will it will keep the message in there all it, all it does is pretend that it didn't match any of the input So there's the the um, that alternative operator comes from applicative. So it's not just for parsing. There are you can do it for. I can't think of an example off the top of my. Um, yeah, but but it's a non-parsing exceptions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you, one way you could actually rewrite um, this is um, you could take the Tuesday and Thursday options and part, fold them together into a thing that said I'm going to look for a, tr a T and then inside the T I'm going to have a, a line for Tuesday and a line for Thursday and then at the end of those return the appropriate numbers and that's and sort of start analysing the parse tree in your head or on paper. Um, and I, don't, I, I use Haskell quite a lot for prototyping stuff, so I tend to prefer the expensive, expensive but less mentally intensive approach. But that would be a way to do in this specific case. Um, without it. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things with um, um, one of the generations of the U parsing lib um, does stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Some of this stuff, um, it's another thing where that kind of compiler based analysis, if you start using monads, where, where you can start. Um, changing what you're going to look for based on what you've received 
some of the automatic analysis of that gets a little bit complicated as well, which is why they, they were, the Utrecht people were really into arrow-based parsers, and then before, well, applicative parsers are, are a specialization of that, or a restriction of that. Um, did that, did that. <coughs> so I'll have a, a little ch chat about um, error messages. Okay. When I have this JSON value and I pass in the string lemon, which isn't a JSON value, it gives me this error message that there was an unexpected error. What I was actually expecting was the word true, the word false, or a quote, all sort of escapes, or an square bracket or a um, squiggly bracket and um, maybe I can tidy that error message up a little bit so there's this combinator you feed in a parser and you feed in a string and if the parser works you get the same output if the parser doesn't work the error message gets changed into that string okay so um, we can say this JSON there's an HTML error there. In there, stick that operator in the gap. That's what happens when you write your slides in HTML. Um, so now, if I do that same parse, instead of the, the, the quote mark, it's replaced it with string literal. Okay, but it's formed the rest of the error message form. Okay, and I could do that. Um, I could put... Um, on all five of those if I wanted to and you'd end up with much nicer looking error messages like that expecting a boolean string little literal array or object um, or I could just stick a error message on the whole JSON value thing and then I would get an error like JSON value and I suppose it's some personal taste and application dependent what, it, what it's appropriate to put the um, error messages on but I think these are um, all prettier looking than the original error message which was that one okay. and then finally um, we've got um, this example so I'm going to pass the string false and I get out um, a boolean false which is correct. Now I'm going to pass the string falsehood, which isn't valid JSON. What do I get out? Well, I get back out a boolean false as well. Okay. And um, what's happened here is parsec doesn't mind there being stuff on the end of what it's parsing. Okay. This JSON parser or any parser will just parse until there's no more to parse. And as long as it's matched what it needed so far, that's what you'll get. And it'll just ignore what's left at the end. Okay, um, so that's a bit of a problem. And there's a nice parser called EOF end of file. All it does is matches the end, end of file. So what this says is match a JSON value, whatever, and then you must be at the end of the file or the string or whatever the input is. Okay, so now we run through this. Um, it will get to column six, which is actually here, and say, well, I got an H, but I was really expecting the end of the input. Okay, so that's pretty much, yeah, on this one, yeah. Yeah. Um, it would say, yeah, it would say now I'm expecting, um, you'd probably get an error saying that it's expecting a comma because it's got that, it was done as a set by saying, uh, give me a, a value, value, comma, value space, comma. And so what it's expecting after the false is either a space or a comma. Yeah. I'm not sure off the top of my head exactly what the error message would look like, but that's, you would get an error at that point, yeah. Yeah, so 
yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put EOF in, this is a bad example, where you would put EOF is when I went back to parsing this file right back here. If I go back, parsing this file, I might pass JSON value EOF there to make sure that I, I'd read everything in the file. Um, so that's pretty much it. I'll just briefly go through the various keywords. Functions, there's parse, which will parse a string, which is pure functional um, thing. Or there's parse from file, which will file in from disk and apply a parser. And then we've got these little building block parsers that we can make stuff up out of. Can match a string, match string and true. Um, you can match a single character using char. I want you to match a quote. You can say, I want you to match everything that a set of characters. So I can say, don't match a, don't match a space using none of. Or zip. I want you to match maybe a digit. So maybe I want to, when I write my numbers parser, the numbers 0 to 9. Um, there's end of file. Doesn't actually characters, it just makes sure we're at the end. Um, pure also doesn't match because it always returns a value no matter what's going on. That's how we got the true constant and the false constant in there. Um, and if we wanted to do, um, I don't know, that's pretty much the, 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 way, the way you'd use it. We've got this um, two symmetric arrow star operators, so that Yeah. Right sparrow and left sparrow. <laughs> right sparrow and left sparrow. Which one's ri which? All right then. So the right sparrow is on the left, and the left sparrow is on the right. <laughs> sparrow. Yeah. Unlike other birds. Yeah. All right. All right. Well. So right sparrow and left sparrow. What they do, um, <laughs> the sparrow points its beak at the parser that it wants to keep the value. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you could, you don't use them in pairs. If you use them like that, then you'll keep the values. You'll keep the value from the middle, but you can just use them on their own. Yeah. Um, alternative, that pipe operator, put two parsers together, the first you of. Um, fmap and dollar in brackets, they're the same function. One is a, func a prefix function and one is an infix operator. And that lets us um, apply an arbitrary function to the output of a parser, if that parser works. Do note, that's just monads, which everyone understands intimately. Um, we've got question mark for sticking error messages on, and we've got try for doing non-determinism and backtracking if we want to. And um, there's actually a load of other stuff. So I sort of just briefly, well, I, I only introduced the, the, the combinators that I needed to use. If you go and look at the Haddock online documentation for RSEC, there's a bazillion um, different functions. Um, for um, sticking stuff together for parsing languages. So a lot of the time, when you have, there's some structure that you're trying to parse, um, you might find that someone's already written the, the bulk of it. Okay. And that is, oh, going backwards. That is the end. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, that that you would use with spe you would use that with um, pure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Negative also has. So there's um, many comes from applicative, so that's not parser specific. And the dollar stuff are not parser specific. They're they're from applicative. Fmaps, not even applicative. That's just a normal functor. Um, so.
So that's, like I said, is like mapping over a list. You've got a, a structure with something interesting going on and you somehow dump a function on the front of it, which I don't know, I used to. Parses and, parses and lists, as, the, as I came across, I found that very hard to mentally reconcile. What was it? Yeah, maybe it's one of them. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so uh, there's um. Well, I'm not I'm not doing crazy performance stuff. So I think that Atosec people have put a bit more effort into. So Atosec is another part of Combinator Library. Um, it doesn't behave exactly like this, but if you can understand this, you should be able to line up with the, with the Atosec documentation. Um, all the cool people use Atosec these days, apparently, apart from the uber cool people who use the thing with a T. No, oh God, those people. I used to hang. I used to hang out at Utrecht University, so I'm, I say those people. <laughs> I'm not just being rude. Um, uh, Edward Kmet came up with it the other week. Try, try something. Trifecta. Yeah. So there's loads of different stuff about. Um, yeah. yeah. The big problem, I think, that I don't think that's the So there's a there's a that um, I haven't mentioned that um, let me find a, an error message. Um, so we had this parser type in um, uh, it must be one somewhere I've seen it. Okay, um, there's a um, this parser type. Where I say here's a parser JSON value, but it actually that's a type alias for this much longer type inside. And if you want, um, what we've been doing is parsing strings of characters. Um, you can actually use parsec for parsing strings of anything. Okay. So um, I've never done that. I've never had the, the need to do it. But um, much of much of the stuff, <coughs> basically any of this stuff that hasn't referred to characters, you would be able to use for parsing other stuff. So you wouldn't be able to use char. You would you would be able to use the alternative operators and try and the do notation. And, um, <coughs> yeah. oh. Yeah. Yeah, then you'll loop, won't you? Yeah. Uh, I usually start without try, and the moment I have a problem, I stick a try in. But um, I, I used to use try a lot more, and I found it very alluring as a, a youthful person of two years ago. Um, to use try a lot, but it really doesn't. Like I, there was no need for try in in that um, in that JSON example. Um, there wasn't really even a need for try in the days of the week example because we could have rewritten it um, to not use it. So, yeah. It's, so yeah, I mean, it's, part of me wants to say your data format's pretty fucked up if you need to use it. And you're going to have other. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 
Thank you very much.